Thank you for thank you for seeing all of us. Uh, this is our instructional leadership team, uh, and hopefully, and they, they've they've had some conversation with their departments about our building use. Uh, hopefully, we'll have a few other folks trickle in, and then we also have our two o'clock meeting with you. So um, they've all received sort of the, the the email that you sent, and why don't why don't they do some introductions, and then so you know who you're talking with and then we will yeah. introduce I think we'll we'll kick it off with Mr. Gussenberg because this is actually an official town meeting and he's got some yeah uh, so we have to go through a couple oh, of yes, procedures automatically to open the meeting because we're a subcommittee of the town council so I call this meeting to order if you would do the roll uh, Mr. Gussenberg there. Ms. Bates not, not here and Ms. Kemp we here. do have a quorum present okay and we have to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I see a little flag up there. Somewhere. Oh, I see another one over yeah. in the corner. Yes. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You want to start or you want to start? Why don't you start? All right, you started all the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. Um, as you know, uh, the Town Council and the Board of Education got together a few months ago and decided if they were ever going to move the process forward in terms of modernizing our schools, we needed to have some kind of a joint committee to do that. The Board of Ed, three years ago, had uh, come up with a plan, uh, had brought that plan to uh, the Town Council, and it, it didn't go forward from there. <clears throat> so the town council and the board of ed set up a joint committee three members of the town council three members of the board and i always forget is it five or seven 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 members of the community of which we are from the community group um and does everybody know you that rich Gussenberg? oh i'm sorry i didn't introduce myself rich Gussenberg. Um, i was a principal for many many years i'm semi-retired now i do some consultant work uh, I was on the Board of Ed recently, and uh, now I'm just spending my whole life doing this. <laughs> and Anne-Marie, you want to take a second? Yeah, I'm Anne-Marie Kemp. Um, again, I rep I'm a representative on the committee uh, from the community. I actually chair the School Modernization Committee. Um, I am a high school parent. So I'm in my seventh year here at the high school with a few more to go. Um, and, uh, you know, really happy to get your input. We toured the school a few weeks ago as a full committee with uh, Dr. Gad. Um, so we've seen it. We know it. Um, and really looking for you for some forward thinking about what we really need for um, education in the future and what we really need in our high school. Yeah. Um, yeah, my son did go through the high school many years ago, and I was one of those band parents who spent his whole life out on the field, mm -hmm. having Nothing wrong trucks with that. and moving things around. Um, so uh, the the town council set a, a, a timeline of hopefully having a plan to them in early September uh, with the idea that the town council could approve at least the first part of that plan uh, in September, bring it to a referendum in November. Uh, that's a very aggressive timeline, and I'll be honest with you, I don't know that the committee is going to meet that, um, but they're working very hard to do that. We're having multiple meetings of multiple groups uh, they've set up uh, three different subcommittees that are working right now, uh, and the full committee is meeting twice every month. Um, you can feel free to sit over here too. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, so what our subcommittee has been charged with going around to all of the schools. Uh, we've so far been at Doolittle. Uh, we've uh, talked to the people uh, doing the alternative high school at Humiston. Uh, we went to Dodd, um, and we have meetings at each of the schools in the district because we want to really hear from all of the staff members. Um, we are videotaping. I hope that doesn't alarm or concern anyone. Uh, but the reason for that is we want both our full committee members and people out in the community to be able to get firsthand what we're doing. We also take notes in the minutes of these meetings, go out to all of the committee members, um, so that everybody gets a feel for what's being said. It's not all being just funneled through us. So we really want you to be open and honest. We want you to discuss not only some of the concerns you may have with the facility, but also some of the positive aspects of, of the school and what it does. Um, 
and we really would like you to, as much as possible, focus on your programs and the way programs maybe are evolving and changing as we go forward, and whether this facility is able to meet the needs of those programs or whether there needs to be other kinds of things that are done. Whether we come out of this by saying that we're going to do renovations or new construction, there's a lot of pieces there and obviously there's a lot of financial issues which are way above my pay, pay grade as we get into this process. Um, but uh, we're hoping that uh, going through this very open process that the community will at least be able to see the issues, the problems, whatever. Uh, we would ask, um, as you make comments, if you could introduce yourself and also tell what your role is in the school uh, so that um, as we do the minutes, uh, we can get that down. And we urge you to be as open and honest as you possibly can. So at that, I open it up to you. And this is a very informal conversation. And so jump in any way you want. Sure. <laughs> I'm gonna, um, I'm not sure uh, what has this committee done to look at. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, so Leslie Pear, uh, I am a, a teacher. P e h r. P a i e r. Um, I'm a business department teacher. Thank you. I'm a parent. I'm a taxpayer. Um, what I'd like to know is what has the committee looked at so far in terms of what does a modern school look like? Um, what does a modern school look like, an up-to-date school? Um, what does 21st, what have you seen so far um, in terms of 21st century learning that's outside of, of our little world of Cheshire here? Um, and I'm, I'm looking at the school, not only the school structure, but also um, the learning environments and how students are learning. And it, it's different today than it was um, many years yeah. ago. Yeah, Anne Marie is in charge of the whole committee. <laughs> and one of the subcommittees she set up is doing just that, yeah. which I happen to be on. So, yeah. uh, so we do have a subcommittee that, well, this group is focused on speaking to all of you. We have another group that is doing out of district tours. So that group, actually, their first tour starting next week. Um, but we are visiting other school districts in the state that have gone through similar processes of Cheshire, either for modernizing school, whether it's been new construction, renovation. So we are going out visiting those schools at all levels, elementary, middle, and high school, to see what it is that they have just built. Like these are all schools that have been renovating or built in the last year or two. Um, so you have a whole group focused on that so we can see what is out there. Um, in March, our Board of Education will be presenting to our committee um, what they see as the vision for, you know, we hear all about 21st century learning, um, and there's been some discussion around what that means in terms of more common spaces and ha how collaboration and things like that, but the Board of Education is going to be presenting to us um, what that means to them, where they see the future of education. So between, you know, that guidance and what we see externally from other school districts, we'll be taking a lot of those learnings in terms of what we need here at Cheshire. And it's important because uh, the committee, for the most part, uh, does not have educators on it. Um, I'm the only one that's a K a K-12 educator, and we have one person on who's a college person. Most of the other people, they may be in various businesses and things like that. So we're making sure that everybody is educated in what schools need. Uh, and obviously, some people think of schools as just, you know, square room and you put people in there and that's what happens so you know we're, we're talking to them uh, deeply about the changing nature of education as we go forward and that's a challenge for us right i'm sure you, you would all agree like we have excellent schools we keep you know, our kids test so great so a lot of perception is there's nothing wrong and i went through those schools you know you have people out there say oh i went to cheshire high school and i'm like well yeah it was good enough for you but things have changed since most of us were in high school. So again, making sure we're evolving our schools to, to teach for the future. Well, so I'll, I'll speak for the business department. Um, our rooms vary in sizes from a room that's a little bit smaller than this to a room that's probably a quarter of the size of this um, with 24 students potentially in that room. And a lot of what we do is we have uh, project-based uh, assignments or assessments. We have students collaborating. Um, they need flexibility as just as they move around that, that room. 
uh, seating and tables are um, something that you know we need to talk about to allow our students to work in that capacity. Um, other other issues, and I think other people will bring this up too. Um, the whether it's a small room or a large room, there are issues with um, with temperature. There, you know, there are issues across the board with um, you know all different um, physical aspects of the classroom. So I'll just I'll, I'll start the conversation that way. That we'd like to um, whether it's a the existing school and, or, or a new school, we'd like to be able to, you know, work with our students in a way that they're going to work in college and in a way that the 21st century workforce is changing. We want them to be prepared to work in, in a way that um, companies are, are changing now and how they're working together. Piggyback a little bit. Name. Um, Name oh, sorry, Michelle Catusi, C A T U C C I, and I'm the school counseling department chair. Uh, I think from the perspective of, of what modern schools need, one of the things that Cheshire is doing very well is supporting the social emotional needs of our students, um, having that focus on SEL. Um, so we are currently located in the new part of the building, <laughs> um, upstairs, um, in the front where I think that that, that facade looks great from the street but even if you get up into <laughs> to our world and in the bath wing as well because they're upstairs with us um, we have a lot of the same issues with temperature um, the carpets in our office um, you know might be health concerns there with mold and things like that um, that the roof leaks into some of the offices up there the plumbing's not great um, the windows don't open in all of the rooms but I think from the SEL perspective we um, have been so supportive and having enough staff for our students' social emotional needs that we are now out of space to <laughs> to have we can't have more staff physically in the space that we have between the school psychologists, the school social workers, and the school counselors, um, and we um, have lost a lot of space for meetings and testing and things like that because we have had the, the influx of staff and the student needs continue to grow. Um, so we just need more space to be able to provide programming that can support our students that. Um, might not be able to come to school a full day, and so we need like an alternate plan for uh, somewhere to house them so that they're not, you know, um, missing school time and they're being productive when they're here. Um, we run a lot of groups here, which is uh, different from a lot of high schools across the country, so continuing to have that space to run groups and provide that, that SEL um, support as well. Um, but really, if we are expanding any services that we have, we physically don't have anywhere to put new people um, with the current structure that we have. Thank you. Um, I'm amazed how many people I do talk to in town who say, you have a brand new high school. <laughs> and I don't realize this at the side of the front, but you know, walk in 20 feet in, it's not as yeah. new a high school as you thought it was. But. Yes, sir. Uh, Tim Galvin. I'm a social studies department chair, uh, also parent and taxpayer, uh, like Leslie. Uh, both my children are in the elementary school uh, right now at Highland. Um, I just want to echo some of the uh, yeah, themes that Leslie brought up in terms of, you know, this building was constructed in the 1950s when instruction was much different um, and it was very lecture driven and the small classroom spaces we have might have fit the time when students entered the room and were mostly, you know, stationary for the remainder of the period. Um, and I think we definitely could benefit from more flexible um, arrangements and learning environments. And when I say flexible, I, oftentimes in a history or social studies classroom, students are going to shift between maybe some note taking or individual work to collaborative work and then maybe back to individual work. All in one period, we might have three phases of that class. And it's very difficult in, in the classroom environments we have to kind of shift between the, those. Um, you know those sequences and I think we've made efforts to try and bring some new furniture and some new tables in to facilitate cooperative learning um, but the, the spaces are so cramped that even when you bring new furniture in it doesn't address the structural nature of our classrooms which are they're too small um, to allow for flexibility within a class period they also don't allow for and Leslie spoke to this as well um, you know, there will be periods where our students are working on, um, you know, project-based authentic opportunities um, and we don't have a workspace for students to collaborate in large numbers of three or four together effectively. Um, so oftentimes uh, 
a teacher might try to reserve this room. Sometimes I bring my students down here if it's available. Uh, this is one room in the midst of the whole building, and I think we could we could benefit from trying to create classroom environments that allow for the, the modes of instruction that uh, most of the teachers are doing pretty regularly here. Thanks. Yes. Steve Trafone, the athletic director here. Um, I'm also a Cheshire resident. Uh, in my role, fortunately, I get an opportunity to, to visit many schools in the state uh, as our teams travel to, to contests. And uh, I've been in quite a few schools that have either been renovated and or built uh, within the last 10, 15 years. And uh, having the opportunity also, usually with their athletic director, to sometimes tour the school. Uh, and the big thing that I note with those schools is um, the change from the, as kind of coming off of what Tim was saying, the, the institution type of building that was built more in the 60s and, and 50s to more of an open air uh, inviting um, building where there's plenty of room, plenty of storage, uh, that the rooms aren't necessarily designed for the structured rows of, of tables, but uh, designed more of a, an open setting classroom. Um, and I think that's more inviting to the students. Uh, the one thing I know that we are lacking here is we don't have a facility here where we can house all 1,400 plus students at one time. Mm -hmm. It's just the nature of the way that the school was designed o over the years. Um, so that concept when you walk into some of these new schools, whether it's their auditorium, gymnasium, or just at the main lobby, they're very inviting. As you said, the front of our school is inviting walk into 20 feet and it's a kind of a different ball game so uh, that's a big notice that i see in many of the schools that have uh, done some type of change in within the past 10 years do you ever have a time where you want to have an assembly with everyone mm -hmm. and what do you oh, yeah. use the gym no we can't, we can't have the main gym oh okay well, no, i know the auditorium will accommodate no we have anybody. no space that would, that would accommodate the entire school student oh. body so we have to split them in half to all right Yes, sir. Yes, my name is uh, Artur Branco. I'm the World Language Department Chair. Could I have your name again? I'm yes, my sir. name is Artur, A-R-T-U-R. Last name Branco, B-R-A-N-C-O. I'm the World Language Department Chair. Uh, just for the sake of conversation, I, I made some copies of uh, what my department uh, stated at one of our meetings um, that I will share with you. At the same time, I will emphasize a few other things that have been some of my colleagues have talking about it, the instruction aspect. Uh, yeah, that without a doubt is one aspect that really uh, we find it to be of importance. Um, the other thing we're talking about is the working conditions of our teachers as well. Uh, we don't have spaces uh, where they can, in a very professional manner, prepare for classes, meet with students, help students. So we're lacking of that. Uh, many offices serve as lunch room, prep room, and office. Uh, very difficult to really conduct uh, professional meetings, uh, confidential meetings that many times have to take place in the hallway. So that's another aspect I like to add on to it. The other aspect of the rooms being small that obviously are not conducive for instruction. The other aspect is the, uh, the lack of uh, flexibility in the rooms to allow mobility. And at the same time, many times, is very uncomfortable for teachers in those rooms because of they are so small to move around between be, between uh, uh, the desks uh, without having to touch the student in a very uncomfortable way. So many teachers don't do that. They don't have they because of the structure of the rooms, the size of the rooms, don't have that ability to walk around freely and, and work sometimes with students one on one. Um, the other aspect that my department uh, brought about was the. Uh, the air quality, um, you know, we have rooms in our schools that don't have windows, that the uh, air quality uh, changes. We have rooms that sometimes throughout times of the year, the fumes from the buses are, are, are felt inside the classrooms on a regular basis. Um, also, with, when we're talking about air, we talk about temperatures. Uh, the temperatures in many of our rooms in the school is very inconsistent. Uh, sometimes they're too hot, sometimes they're too cold. Uh, and many times they are very uncomfortable, not conducive for learning. 
you know, even myself as a teacher, it's very hard to be teaching in a classroom where it's so cold that myself as a teacher, as an adult, have a hard time really uh, being comfortable there and engaging with students. So I can just imagine our students, which many of them, according to the uh, school laws, they're not allowed to be carrying, to be wearing coats, uh, so it's not fair to them either. And that we have small little things that also that amount to a lot of things, you know. Uh, working toilets, uh, no warm waters in some of the bathrooms. Um, we have locks and doors that we need 4,000 keys to be able to get in. You know, uh, I'm, as a department chair, I'm, 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 I'm allowed to have the keys that open my department. But if I'm not around and something happens, some people in my department don't have access to that. So we have to be looking for a whole monitor. You know, so we're talking about also security issues um, that are not uh, uh, good. Also, uh, we, we're talking about, uh, my department mentioned the idea of the safety as well in the classrooms. We have classrooms, if something happens, to exit those kids out of the classroom in a very serious situation are not the best. Uh, also, the way the classrooms are designed, very difficult to really protect our kids from any type of threats that might be inside or outside as well. Um, and there are many more. That's why I kind of made a copy of the list because I really don't want to take all the time. Uh, but I do appreciate you doing this. I think I've, I've been in the, in the district, or I've been in Cheshire for about 30 years. In the district, I've been for 26. So I haven't seen many changes. You know, I've seen additions. I've seen patches, I've seen band-aids, but we end up in the same situation. So hopefully the town will take uh, serious consideration to our situation and be able to, through the feedback that you will get today and through your visits, be able to uh, design a plan that will accommodate the many things that you'll hear today and in, in the future. Thank so you. thank you. Are you I, sharing classrooms in your department? <laughs> yeah, the other thing I forgot to mention is <laughs> that we have many, stu uh, many students, many teachers on cards. We don't have enough classrooms to accommodate all of our teachers' schedules. That's not conducive as well for, for instruction. You know, when you have to run, you have four minutes to go from one classroom to another, and you have to get there, set up, open up, you lose a lot of instructional time. Um, but those are also stated in the paper I've given you. But that's a major problem that we have. Um, I'm sure it's not just our War Language Department, but all of our departments as well are in the same situation. I should mention that the committee is going around to all of the schools and at their last meeting um, did come to the high school, took the first hour or so of their meeting, visited the building, um, you know, uh, were brought around by your principal, uh, and then took time afterwards to discuss, you know, what they have seen. So they are going out to the schools, but obviously they're not seeing it while the kids are here. Mm -hmm. It's a very different place when you've got... 1400 high schoolers here. There were a lot of kids here that night. There were. <laughs> <laughs> there always are. I mean, I drive by the high school 10 times a day, and I don't care yes. if it's Sunday afternoon, whatever. There are always a bunch of cars here. I mean, this building is used extensively. Yes, right. Yes. Um, my name is Deb Bottaro, B O T T A R O, and I'm the department chair of special education. Um, so there's two points that I want to make. Um, the first one is just access to the building um, who we serve as students who have physical disabilities and while they can enter the building at the front a lot of our <coughs> meetings our um, after school activities are held in different places so for example where our support services office is located a student who has physical disabilities or a parent would not be able to come into the side of the building because there are, there's not a ramp there it's mm -hmm. stairs and also for fire drills and things like that if a student is located on that type that side of the building certainly we have a plan for them but it's not easily accessed you know they have to take extra time to get where they need to be um, as far as like um, the gym or the auditorium if a student is upstairs um, in math or in guidance and they have to get down to the auditorium the only way they can do that is to take the elevator that's down in the corner on the opposite side of the building and then head over to the gym or the auditorium so I guess what I'm trying to convey is that it's just a lot less a lot more time for them for them to get where they need to be the second point I want to make is in terms of special education we're so driven by legislation and um, you know, the building was built in the 50s and certainly legislation has changed over the years to service um, students and 
We also have transition standards that have been put in by the state of Connecticut, which means we have to prepare them for life after high school. So from, for some of our students are most, who are involved in the most restrictive programming, we have to, in, we have to um, support them in independent living. So meaning making a bed, you know, washer and dryer. Um, they have also have a lot of therapies. We need space for that. And our administration has been very responsive to that. And I don't want to ask for any more space, but um, it would be nice because our therapies and our transition room, every, everyone's just on top of one another. Um, we try to be respectful of people and give them the privacy that they need when they are having physical therapy or speech therapy. Um, but it, it is a challenge. It is a challenge. And you know, when these buildings were built in the 1950s, there were no special needs programs. Exactly, uh, right. One of the things that the full committee found interesting is Vin Massiano was the, uh, I don't know what his official title is, but he's the business manager of the school district, um, did a presentation to the committee showing, because some people were looking, said, well, our enrollment has gone down by about a 1,000 students over the last few years. We should have all these empty spaces. Mm -hmm. And he showed the growth of the special needs programs and how there was no space in the district at all, mm -hmm. um, and how if you didn't have that space, you'd be outplacing and it would cost you a fortune. Correct. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that was eye-opening for, for many of the people. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, Dan Tartarelli, I'm one of the assistant principals at the school, and I want to focus on the exterior. I know there was a study done recently, but I just wanted to reiterate the importance of it, um, namely parking. We, right now, even when our enrollment is at its lowest, we almost never have enough spots to accommodate the number of student drivers who go to the school. So we force, not force, but we, student, our youngest, newest drivers have to park in Bartlam across the street, and then they need to cross a busy uh, street during morning rush hour to get to the school building, which is a huge safety hazard. Um, in the morning drop-off, parents only have the one entrance to come into, and if everybody's cooperating, you have one side where the parents will drop off, and the other side is for teachers to be able to access and get to work on time. Um, sometimes that's not happening, you know, uh, without some kind of issues. Um, parents will sometimes have to drop their kids off on Route 10 because they're unable to get to the front of the building on time for their kids to arrive to school. Um, buses in the morning and after school are competing with student drivers and parents picking up. They're often being cut off or wrestling for, you know, for a position to get to the light just so they can exit the parking lot or enter the parking lot. So um, I think there's a huge importance in the idea of renovating the parking areas and providing spaces for our students. I've learned a lot of back roads not to go down many <laughs> certain, certain times of the day. <laughs> T-A-R-T-A-R-E-L-L-I. Yes, sir. Uh, Michael Early, Art Department Chair. E-A-R. E-A-R-L-E-Y. So we have three art teachers at Cheshire High School. We have two classrooms. Uh, one classroom was designed as an art room in the 50s, I guess, and it looks like it. Um, uh, cabinets are falling apart. Plumbing is horrible. You never know if you're going to get hot water out of the faucet or cold water. I just left a class just now. A girl was trying to wash her hands. It came out so hot that you could have made tea from the water. Um, the um, furniture, I believe, came when the school came. That's how old it is. The tabletops are all scratched and dug into and it's very hard to draw on top of that surfaces. Chairs are falling apart um, and that's in the good room. The other room is um, formerly two math rooms and they were combined. The wall was taken down partially between so it's a very long thin room. It's just not conducive to what we teach art these, um, in the 21st century. We're trying to get kids to um, bring in their own supplies, draw their own things. It's more choice based and when they start bringing things into draw there's no place to store them, there's no place to put them. We're also trying to give students a variety of art materials at the same time, so we're not just teaching one material at one time. They have a selection of what they can choose from. So we started going to um, sort of like shoebox types of things to cover the supplies in, but when, again, there's no place to put them. They're on carts. They have a cart filled in one class, a cart filled in another class. You've got 18 tables in there that don't fit. You can't walk around. There's no place to put up still lifes. Um, 
it's just, it's just not conducive. There's no place on the walls to hang artwork because one wall is windows and one wall is sinks and one wall is supplies. Um, so it's just not really the best for art. Not to mention where we are. We're in the basement. So how to have visual arts are in the basement in no one to see us. So it would be nice if we're more part of the community. Understand? Yes? My name is Sean, S-E-A-N, McEwen, M-C-K-E-O-W-N. Um, I'm Michael's neighbor in the basement. <laughs> I'm going to start with some positives for a moment here. I believe that the transition from industrial arts to technology and engineering education, um, the lab space, the floor plans, the actual X by Y footprints of our rooms were preserved from much larger industrial arts types of education. With a new shift to 21st century, um, especially with us partnering with community colleges, we're, we're acquiring a lot more larger equipment for these rooms, and the space is going to fill quickly. In our rooms, I see safety issues all day long. I see cords dropped across floors because we can't drop things from the ceilings because there's nothing up there, or the water's leaking from the science labs upstairs. There's a constant leak in our, um, down the wall near our drill charging station in the wood <coughs> At least we know where our trash cans are at all times because they're also <laughs> catching, <laughs> catching the drips that are coming through. There's definitely air quality issues when it comes to not just vacuuming, but dust collection and fumigation of the types of work that we're doing. Um, the science rooms sometimes feel the pain of our, of our project-based learning that we're doing inside of our classrooms. If I want to bring in a, an industrial um, welding type of class, I legally shouldn't be doing it in the space that we have because the fumes cannot get out of the classroom. If we want to do any sort of wood finishing, um, we're doing it outside, right? We're not doing it inside of a, a finishing room that all other high schools have. Um, I speak for also our family consumer science courses. We have a, culinary, a dynamic culinary arts program and an early childhood education program. And I can tell you that when we have a when we have a play school come in here for the weeks that they're here, they're crawling around on a floor that is not safe. It has um, electrical outlets that we that are live on the corners on the floor. There needs to be more drops coming down from the top. That floor can be like 95 degrees in the morning because it's above the boiler um, in that area. Then we have this like quasi commercial kitchen which would never pass real safety inspections of a commercial kitchen. And then it goes over to our culinary arts room, which any DIY show on any of your networks would just love to blow up and start over with. And it is, we're, again, we're trying to partner with more uh, community colleges for college credit. And our instructor is highly qualified. I don't know if our space would pass the test in order to earn the credits that we're looking to have our students earn. I know when we met with Dodd, they talked about the need to increase the culinary arts program because yeah. there's a great deal of interest there. So there is a great deal of interest there. There was a space there um, two decades ago. And, and as Deb mentioned a second ago, there is increasing need for space for support services. The room that was the kitchen at one point. And it was also, it was also a staffing funding issue. If you could save $100,000 by not filling that position, you don't have to pay that salary anymore, and that, that's what happens to those positions, and I think Mr. Fung could, could help out with that. Um, our rooms, the, the windows, again, I, I could just repeat everything. The windows either can't open because they'll fall out of the top because they're up high. You have to pull them open with like a little bar. Um, I have little notes on some of the windows that you don't open those because they will fall down and smash onto the concrete floor. Concrete floors are, um, they're waxed in the summertime for some reason. And then when sawdust gets onto them, it is incredibly slippery in the classroom, and that's not the correct treatment for that lab. It's just what is done to every square foot of the floors inside this school. Furniture is easy, right? You can replace furniture inside labs. Um, our furniture that we use in the majority of our classrooms was either found in another hallway that someone was throwing away, or something that we built custom to save money than, let's say, instead of buying furniture. Um, we have furniture in our computer lab that was donated from a bank in 1998 that was upgrading their furniture. Um, it would be nice to have things in our culinary arts lab like dishwashers. And I really fear that, you know, right now we have a little tiny window air conditioner in our culinary arts room with eight ovens running at 350 degrees all day. 
and if we replace these windows as part of a building improvement project, we're now asking our students and teachers inside that classroom to boil all day long. And that's not fair, and that needs to be addressed if we are looking at doing any sort of modernization in these areas. We're also asking these kids to roll around the floor inside this, this classroom, which is a classroom and a, and a play school. And we need places to make that two different spaces. If it's the same space, to put away the tables, to put, pull out the cubbies and all that kind of stuff. And we, don't, we don't have a place to put that. Um, we're sharing athletic storage. We're leaving stuff in the hallway. We're getting cited by the fire marshal um, in technology education classrooms. There's really no true place for project storage. You know, we create piles of stuff, we make it work. Um, our raw materials, we process those raw materials. Where do we store those raw materials? You know, we've been clever with our own solutions, but there is no like formal place for us to keep, keep our stuff. When it comes to sharing classrooms, um, we look at it through the lens of the classroom is the lab facility that services those types of classes. So we do migrate around based upon what we do teach. So I don't necessarily see the, the need necessarily for all of us to have our own classroom. Um, we need our own prep space. We need places to meet with parents and students. But sometimes the lab itself is used by three or four teachers revolving because that's that space and three or four different types of classes can happen inside that space. But being mindful of that, when you design these spaces for the future, um, they need to be adaptable for the different. So a, an architecture class is in the same room as a CAD class, which is the same room as a robotics class. Those are all three different types of projects that are happening inside that classroom. And there's really like from Tim to, to myself for floor space for kids to walk around and to do that type of work. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. John Keener, K-U-H-N-E-R, music department. Um, we've got quite a bit of space, but unfortunately it's disconnected uh, in many ways. Um, it's very difficult for us to uh, have students participate fully in the choir if they have any kind of disability. Um, the choir room itself, uh, they've got to stay up at the top uh, of, the, of the room or they have to go outside to come in the lower door. Um, so uh, the design <coughs> issue there. Uh, also having the choir room, it's an, an old lecture hall away from the rest of the music department um, makes it difficult for us to collaborate. Um, instrumental to choral, which uh, is, is, is a challenge. And then also our storage areas are kind of spread out over the building. We've got one that's on the other side of the auditorium, <clears throat> others in back of the old band room, which is on the completely other side of the auditorium, and then some in the, in the, in the band room. So that's a supervision issue, a safety issue. Uh, equipment has to come outside from the newer band room, which is in the back of the building, um, outside, around, through a loading door, um, into the auditorium and in all kinds of weather, um, sidewalks not in the greatest condition, <coughs> chair carts can easily fall, and so on. Um, but uh, you know, having a music department that would be all connected and, and within close proximity would be ideal. Uh, I know that would be a huge challenge with the amount of space that we, we use. Um, where we have large ensemble spaces, which are, are, are good size, we don't have small breakout spaces that we can utilize like practice rooms. Um, practice rooms that are soundproofed, that have glass uh, windows for supervision purposes. We have some small little rooms in the back of the old band room where there's a, a couple of bathrooms as well that need to be remodeled. Right now they're, they're just closed. Um, but you really can't have students in those rooms um, you know, because it's, it's not visible. There's no windows in the doors. So they're, they're basically more storage uh, cubbies uh, at this point. Um, the instrument storage room and the new band room where the size of the room is, is, is adequate, the cabinets need to be replaced. Uh, when those cabinets were put in in 2001, uh, they went with a, a lower grade to save some money instead of going with the Wanger uh, cabinet, which is the standard um, that will last you know, 20 to 30 years or more. Um, and they're starting to break up. It's a, it's, a, it's a compressed particle board construction. They're starting to break up. Uh, doors are bent. They're not locking anymore. Um, so, and then HVAC. Um, in um, the, the old band room, which is near the auditorium, where it's not right. room 118. Spent a lot of time in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, there are no windows in there, um, as you know. And, and you know, where the, you know, the air conditioning units for the auditorium and the gym are now on top of the old band room. There is no air conditioning in that space. So to get some uh, AC in there, I think it would be helpful. Um, for a couple of students, uh, they had to bring in temporary units um, you know, because of health, health reasons. And, and um, so there's a temporary fix for that situation. But um, you know, because there is no way to get to open a window there, it, it would be 
important to have that. And also, I think in room 57, the, the chorus room, if there's a way to do that, because we do have meetings in that space as well, um, to get some AC there. One, one positive is a window was installed, so at least there is some fresh air coming in. Um, but if a student or someone's sitting next to that window, they're, they're getting a cold blast, whereas everyone else might be uh, um, you know, uh, in the other space a little warmer. Uh, and just airflow in general. Uh, it would be good to get uh, some circulation going in, in both those rooms. Um, in the new band room area, um, there's uh, a heating issue where you've got certain spaces that warm up to almost 90 degrees, I think. It, it is, you're getting blown out of a small space. And then the larger space, it's very cold. So the thermostat's over there. It's just a one zone heat for that entire extension of the building. And I think that's a, actually gas, uh, whereas the other, there's uh, so many different heating systems. Um, so you know, temperature control. All natural gas, <coughs> taking out the oil tanks. Right, right. And um, so I think it's uh, you know there's there's three of us. Um, it's very difficult to supervise uh, you know 160 to 200 kids at any given time in that space when we're in different areas. Um, so uh, the storage space is being closer and practice room space, small ensemble space. And then uh, one other issue would be the acoustics. Um, We've got very different acoustics uh, in the three different rooms. We've got uh, room 57, very live space, actually conducive to choir to a certain extent, but it could be dampened a little bit. Uh, then we've got the old man room, which is very dry, uh, which is not bad, but um, that's probably the best room that we have for rehearsals. The new band room right now, uh, we've put some acoustical treatment, but it's not effective. Um, and so I think we have to go further and put curtains in that room to, to deaden that sound. I think it's a hearing conservation issue. Um, it's very difficult to hear in that space. And then we go to the opposite situation on stage where it's very dry and there really should be acoustical shell there to warm up the acoustics instead of having all the curtains and all the absorption happening. And a lot of the sound, especially strings for instance, just and choral, just drops off right at the proscenium of the stage. If we get them down in the pit, you can hear them. As soon as you get anyone on the stage, you get the mic on. Um, and then that's, that's another challenge with the HVAC system that's so loud in that space to begin with, to be able to, to, to fix that situation. Um, and I think the two air conditioning, or one of the air conditioning units in the auditorium is not functioning right now. I know that's a huge expense to fix, but um, that, that's the one that's on the stage itself. So it's very hot for the performers. Audience is freezing out, out um, uh, in the audience. They're, they, they're very comfortable and the kids are sweating. So if there's a way to fix that um, in the future as well. Okay. We'll do you oversee the drama program too? I do not. Okay, because I'm wondering about the stage and the facilities and that sort of thing. Yeah, and the lighting board it also has to be upgraded at some point. Yes. You know, that's that's another another big expense too. So. Yeah, I, I'm uh, Ian Wilderman, English department chair. Ian Wilderman, W I L D E R M A N N, the English department chair. Um, just in terms of, because I spoke with the uh, two drama teachers before um, this meeting and they had very similar complaints about the auditorium, um, just the acoustical issues, the sound and lighting being antiquated and just like everything else, the staff we have does an excellent job making do with what we have, but that both the, the structure of the room and the electronics that go along with it are, are antiquated for what they're, what they're trying to do. Is there room in the back for storage of no. props and? No. 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 So they, have, they have a separate. Mary again. I'm sorry. Mary, they have a separate room for all of the. We actually saw they that. The costumes. They have a separate room for costumes, costumes, separate areas for um, for sets. But the sets are built off, in some cases, off site in the, in the woodworking room. Then they're brought on stage, and some work is they, done. They use the bathrooms as dressing rooms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> A lot of the set building happens on stage, and it's it's closing the, off the auditorium right. for that period of time. So if we had a separate set building space with large enough doors uh, to be able to get that into the backstage, um, uh, we'd be, you know, we'd be able to open up that auditorium for more use for other events as well. So yep. Yep. I can speak to that real quickly. Um, Sean McEwen again. Those the technical theater courses happen in our department, and it is tricky um, to balance building what we call a boat in a basement. So if you're trying to build a set that has a 50-foot deck in a wood shop and carry that thing down to the auditorium, like that, that's not something that's conducive, right? So sometimes we have to build on set, but now you're cutting wood and you don't have the right dust collection on set to do that kind of stuff. So to echo what we're saying here, if we are looking at you know, increasing 
the stagecraft and the technical theater element here, then maybe having that area clean, workable <coughs> shop near the stage, because we have one teacher who is asking kids to be on stage with drills and saws, but to also be in his room to build the boat in the basement so he can drag that thing down across the corner. And it's it's not it's not a good setup at all. We make we make great sets, we make it work. And then there's a little closet, maybe the back sides of this room over here, where you know the two days after that production is done, that entire set gets broken down into whatever we can reuse for flats and any of the stuff that we all the rolling props, and they get stored in this room. And the room is just a room, right? So it's got everything from the past 15 years that we can reuse inside there. So we we do that to save money. You know, we could start all over every single year with all new materials, but if we had a bigger space, we could we could save a lot of money on some of these parts that we can reuse back and forth. But that space just doesn't really exist in a very safe format. Okay. And and uh, and additionally, because of having to sometimes build the state that right. the sets directly on stage, and because this building's used for so much both within the school and the community, that set is then on stage and often interferes with some other events that might want to be held in the auditorium because the set is there on a long-term basis. Good. Yeah, I can uh, kind of speak to that too. I'm also the advisor for Brave, um, and we host uh, Memorial Day and Veteran Day, uh, Veterans Day events here at the high school to honor our local veterans. Um, it's always a little bit tricky in terms of scheduling our event in the auditorium for two reasons. And uh, for Veterans Day, we can run into the uh, drama rehearsals and the, the set is being constructed on the stage, oftentimes parts of it, um, and it can disrupt our uh, ceremony. Uh, the other difficulty, and this connects to something that we talked about earlier too, we cannot have all of our students watch the Veterans Day ceremony in person. Uh, we do a great job with technology sending it out to the classrooms, and they, the underclassmen can watch it on a, a live link, but it, you know, it would be ideal to have spaces where we can have events like Veterans Day or Memorial Day where the entire student body can be in, in the building, in the same location. Um, so I think another thing, um, you know, when you hear about the declining infrastructure of this building, it's substantial. Um, and I think when considering renovations, asbestos abatement and other, um, you know, problems which will be encountered, um, I think it raises questions about whether that's cost prohibitive. <coughs> At what point do you stop adding money into a declining structure that was built, um, you know, 67 years ago? Um, so, you know, I think that that's a concern as well when we think about, um, you know, the example of the art mural, right, that, that we're looking at. Um, you know, if you want to remove an existing mural that's been there for a long time, um, you're concerned about what material is behind that. Um, and it's hard to modernize and improve the climate of the building when every project you consider has a set of costs <coughs> associated with it. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Kathy Sullivan, Physical Education and Health. And um, I know our time's limited, and probably a walkthrough is all you need in the, uh, the gymnasium and the locker rooms. But um, we, the Pluses, we have two gymnasiums. The minuses, they are basically used almost 24-7 between the school system and the community, and that has put a lot of wear and tear on both facilities um, in terms of the floors. Uh, the one up in the East Gym between water damage and usage, it's looked and needs replacement. Um, storage is extremely inadequate, unfortunately, because it's used by so many people. A lot of the equipment has gone missing or has been uh, destroyed and we don't have the budget to replace a lot of items. Um, water fountains, I wouldn't use them. Um, <laughs> they're a little gross um, and they try to keep them clean but they're just, they're old. Um, girls locker room and the offices, the windows are bolted shut because if they weren't they'd be falling out so they're just bolted so we can't get into it. The boys' locker room, because the heat is so high, the windows are left open, sometimes, unfortunately, 24-7. Um, and I don't, I walk in there, I don't blame them. Um, speaker systems work sometimes, sometimes they don't. They don't work in the offices, so that if there is an emergency, we don't often hand it and hear it, or know what to do once we're locked in there with the kids. Um, the locker room down in the West Gym is atrocious. It's an embarrassment to 
have other teams come in and use them. Um, the ceilings are missing. The stalls often don't have doors on them. The toilets aren't working. Ventilation's awful, so the aromas are um, Which locker room was redone a couple of years ago? The upstairs East Gym was the one that we we saw is the redone. And that one's not bad. That one's in pretty good shape. The West Gym is the the antique one, and yes. it's it's awful. Um, there's a handicapped bathroom in, the, in there, which is good, but it's I'm not sure it's ever cleaned. Um, it has poor ventilation, that whole area. Um, there is handicapped accessibility through an open elevator that unfortunately often freezes when the kids are in it, and there are only a few people that have the keys to it, so the um, kids that have to get to the gym often have to go outside. Does matter the weather in order to get into that gym um, so it's uh, heating goes every which way it can be 30 degrees or it can be feel like a sauna in there um, it's difficult to regulate it um, and we have aromas upstairs as well those are nice ones um, so it's in pretty, pretty sad states both of them um, and we also deal with the same situation using the stage because um, sets are built on there and we often use it for advisory for the students and deal with that. We run a couple of leadership programs and have to work around it so we, the facilities are tough in that sense too. Thank you. Field house would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what we can do for you. Yes. yes. Hi. Tanya Quarries, T-A-N-Y-A, K-O-R-E-S. I'm a science teacher, um, a union rep, a secretary and uh, a parent of uh, two, Ch two uh, Chapman Elementary School students. Um, in the absence of our department chair, I wanted to speak up about some of the issues associated with the science department. Um, having 15 current members of the department right now, we have a number of classrooms, some that have that, that workspace, that teacher meeting rooms kind of in between, the prep rooms in between the classrooms, which is great, and they're continually utilized. Several of the other classrooms do not, and so we kind of live and, and work right in that room. So having a space, um, you know, sometimes depending upon the years that we have, the influx of students or the decrease of students, sometimes we add an extra teacher, sometimes we don't. In those years when we add an extra teacher, you know, there is a teacher that is a floater that has no space. and in many cases that it would be a huge issue, right? Because you're continually setting up labs and with our space issue around the building, having students that have study halls in a lab classroom can be a really big issue. And so oftentimes there is a battle, a struggle <coughs> going on between having you know, study halls in your room, especially if you're not in there, uh, and then having your student work out that can be manipulated or trying to set up a lab when that's your only time to be able to set up a lab when you have a class full of students sitting in there. Um, additionally, you know, the cabinets that we have are extremely old and malfunctioning. So open areas in my classroom specifically, there's a whole lot of open storage space. There's very little space that I could close off that students can't access. So some equipment that needs to be locked away I don't have a space for it. In the labs, because a lot of the cabinets can't be locked, the locks don't work, or you need three separate keys for the different locks throughout the room, which you may or may not necessarily have, it becomes an issue. The cabinets in many of the rooms have glass fronts and they've started falling off. Some of the teachers over the years have been injured by cabinets, a glass door falling off on them, um, cabinets smashing, um, the ability to the cabinets stay on their tracks. Uh, the sinks, many of the science classrooms have sinks, but you can't ever get the water turned off. So the water continues to drip consistently, um, even though people have been back several times to take care of it. Uh, the roof is leaking. We've been dealing with some of the classrooms and some of the labs where the water has been leaking in the lab right next to my room, which the floods downstairs um, <laughs> we have had uh, different companies come in several times and they've tried to remedy the situation it has not worked um, we've had just last week or two weeks ago there were five or six tiles that had to be replaced because of water damage 
Uh, one day we walked in, every time it rains, there is water entering the one of the science labs. And we keep a garbage can underneath a cone, because when crowd, we replace the tiles, to the they fall. Office, and Rocco, so there's so much cone, water intrusion that crowd. it was causing the ceiling tiles to collapse. Um, there are a lot of concerns between the science teachers about air quality. Um, I know some people may have to leave, so yeah. if you do, Thank just you. go ahead. Thank you. Thank you all for coming, by the way. <laughs> you have a class, so I'm going to jump in and finish what you have to do. I didn't know if you wanted to do the breakfast. Um, I just wanted to make sure. Um, in the science room, as we move more towards STEM and NGSS, there is a big push on modeling, and there is no space to put those models. You know, as you, you know, we've started going to some NGSS training, which has been awesome, being able to experience that training and start to utilize that in our classroom. And some of the techniques that they, they emphasize that we utilize, we can't because we don't have the space to put it. And that is a big struggle between the teachers as we are moving in that, in that direction. Um, and student backpacks with, and a discussion came up with students, you know, not really utilizing their lockers as much, but they have these humongous backpacks. And in some of our lab classes, the size is also an issue. You have small rooms and you have very large rooms. Having a large room, I can say I love the amount of space that I have and backpacks aren't as much of an issue, but they still are because they're so large. In the smaller rooms, you have teachers tripping over backpacks or no place to put the backpacks, and it's really not conducive to being able to circulate the room, meeting the needs of the students, addressing their concerns, asking questions. Um, and so um, another thing is the windows and the, well, the heating and cooling system, I think we know is already a problem throughout the building. Mm -hmm. um, the windows are also a big issue in the science department because they all open outward. Um, some of them twist, which the, the, um, they don't always work. So some of them you have to push out or kind of reach out the window pretty far to get, get the window back in. But really none of them have any sort of screen. So any type of insects, especially kids with allergies, you have nothing to protect yourself. The best thing that you can do is turn off the lights and hope that the bee goes towards the light. And so that is your way of, you know, trying to take care of your, you know, insect issue that is always a problem. And with the heating and cooling issues, there is very little way to maintain it. For us, the best way to maintain the cooling, especially in the summer, is to leave the window open overnight because that's the only way you get the cool air in to circulate in the building. Because if you close your windows at night, it's suffocating. Um, in my classroom, I made a choice that, you know, to leave the temperature as is, which means I walk into a sauna during the winter, and in the summer, I have a black roof above me, which means I walk into a sauna when it's, when it's hot. Um, so I am one that always tries to leave my windows open to take care of that issue, to, so at least it's cool, so you're not sweating when you first start the day. Um, and I know a number of teachers do that. Thankfully, we're on the second floor, so you don't have the you know, security. people, the security issue of people, you know, coming in and out of the, the windows as an issue, um, but it's not conducive to the way you want to secure your building. And, um, you know, this, I think the storage is an issue, but we have those plumbing and heating in some of our science classrooms, especially the older ones, not necessarily the three chem labs, but the classrooms do have air and gas jets, which they have told do nev never use them because there are leaks in the gas system or the air system and it will cause a really big issue. And so some of those teachers would love to be able to do some different type of demos or experiments in the classroom. They cannot. So, um, I think that's math. Yeah. Other than that, I think I've hit the, the list. Well, thank but you Thank you. Much. Thank you very much. I know you got to run. <laughs> Uh, John Redford. I am a math teacher here at the high school. Would you spell your last name, please? R-E-D-F-O-R-D. Thank you. Um, I uh, also can speak uh, as, as the uh, teachers' union president uh, as well. Um, just uh, let me let me start though with uh, with math. 
Um, I know uh, Cindy uh, Sarlo couldn't uh, couldn't be here today. I know she's uh, she's sick. Um, you know, we we had uh, we got together and uh, to kind of bounced some ideas off of each other. You know, as the things that we'd always uh, you know dream about, wish uh, wish we had um, things that really aren't working the way that they are. Uh, it, it's hard to boil them down to you know to a small uh, number, but um, maybe what I'll do is just give you the give you the sheet um, and let me kind of hit the high points. But um, you know. The largest issue, even school-wide, uh, from my perspective, is uh, probably in every school, is HVAC. I mean, it, it seems like a, a huge number of problems always come down to that. Um, whether it's too hot, too cold, too damp, too, uh, you know, uh, no air, uh, you know, that kind of thing. A huge number of things that uh, come down to HVAC issues. Um, but there's uh, other things, too, that, um, you know, our uh, maintenance uh, things uh, or things that uh, really weren't done right the first time around. Um, the math department is upstairs in the new wing in the, in the wonderful facade, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, we're up there and we're very fortunate in, in like the size of our classrooms because they were built in 2000. Uh, you know, our classrooms are, uh, for the most part, you know, a good size to use as adaptable space. Um, so that's the positive. Uh, the, the negative is there's still some uh, room for improvement as far as uh, particularly two, two classes that we have. Um, you know, we've introduced recently within the last few years a new course called Math Modeling where kids have a hands-on hands -on experience. Um, and it's, you know, and it's in a room, uh, it's basically closet-sized, you know, with no built-ins, no, uh, you know, no ability to store anything from year to year. Um, you know, really, really is not the kind of space that's conducive to the kind of learning that we want to have happening in there. And, and I know, um, you know the, the teacher of it's done, he's done a great job with the program with the limited uh, space and resources that he's had. Um, but it really is a shame that it's not a you know a bigger uh, area and there's not built-ins for him. Um, I know at uh, you know at the time there was money to have cat you know like Christmas tree shop quality uh, you know storage bins and he's made it work. Um, but it's really not. Cheshire deserves better, honestly. You know, the kids uh, really enjoy the class, for a hands-on opportunity, and that's that's what they've got. Um, you know, the other in the other place would be uh, we have a math lab where kids can go for for help. Uh, you know, during the school day, if they have if they have the time to go, we have some support uh, both through interns and uh, and part-time at least uh, teacher schedule. Um, and it, you know the, the space there, uh, no windows. You know we want it to be a welcoming place where kids can come, collaborate with other kids, uh, and it really isn't that kind of space. Um, you know it's a, again kind of a closet-sized room. Uh, you know it's the same uh, same issue with the room size. Was it designed to be a classroom, or was it a closet that was converted? It's actually subdivided from another room, so it's you know. Uh, the two rooms but were it, but one. It, it, Neither room actually ended up with no windows. Neither well, room, neither room actually had windows. Funny enough, yeah, oh, you would right think right it would right. make sense like that, but uh, yeah, it. Uh, anyway, uh, heat, you know, heat issues, uh, hot, no hot water, um, windows and, and doors, uh, you know, windows that I know at least twice have fallen out uh, on the teachers, you know, swung out, and I know it was a temporary fix to you know, put screws into them so they're permanently fixed. Now they can't be cleaned. So now, you know, so now it's the opposite. Um, let's see, uh, a, a sink in the area that we uh, use for lunch, uh, you know, things like that. I'll, I'll pass this along to you. Yeah. But, um, you know, on the bigger maintenance side, uh, you know, the roof was leaked from day one. So the, so the wing was brand new in 2000 and it leaked in 2000. It was, it was never right from the start. Um, you know, so my room I know has had, you know, ceiling tiles replaced four or five times you know, in certain areas, um, just things like that, just still, you know, just, just not the, not old, the war, you know, the warm, uh, you know, even the modern, the quote unquote modern part, uh, right. unfortunately, riddled with problems, with windows and leaky roofs. Um, I wanted to piggyback. I'm, John, can I, can I, I, sure. I have to, I have to run to a meeting, so I just, but I just wanted to, to add in before I head out that I did share with the committee that our, our New England Association of Schools and Colleges, our New England you. Association of Schools and Colleges visit under standard seven did also recommend and I shared this with the committee in our tour but I think it bears repeating did recommend that we resolve our heating and cooling issues and develop a long-term plan to address the aging infrastructure 
Uh, so that was part of that NEASC recommendation, and, and, and those recommendations always need to be addressed uh, in a two-year and five-year uh, reports. I hope so. <laughs> I'm hoping that we can address them. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry to ramble on here. I just had a few more things. Um, just to, to add to, uh, you know, Assistant Principal uh, Dan Tartarelli mentioned the, the parking, uh, you know, a situation out front. Um, you know, and, and one of the things that the school has done to sort of mediate that is they have a custodian go out every single day and place cones, cones and gates to try to, you know, uh, shepherd the traffic in the way that's the most safe. Um, and every single day he goes out and picks them up. I mean, it's talk about a waste of resource. Uh, there's, there's lots of things for him to be doing besides that, uh, you know, the daily chore of every day of putting cones out in the parking lot. So I just wanted to add to what he was say, saying about that. Um, you know, and then uh, just kind of back to the, uh, the three main categories, you know, if I tried to boil this down, the HVAC, uh, the absence of large adaptable space is a common theme. Um, you know, every single department seems like they have they struggle with that. Um, so larger, open, more adaptable space for the kind of learning that they want to have happening. Um, and then the last thing is uh, that, that I think is a huge negative is no space uh, to get the whole school's population together in one with one time. It's a real detriment. I mean, Cheshire deserves better. Um, you know, to have uh, to have these awesome events. You know, brave. Uh, you know, it, these, these great things that are, you know, for vets, and to have the kids watching it over a video feed is in, you know, in separate classrooms, just is not the same. It's really missing, it's really missing, they're really missing the boat because of the facility. Um, so that's really a, a detriment. That's all I have. Th Thank thanks you. thanks for Thank what you're you doing. I know it's not easy. I can, I can imagine being in your position, and, and I know it's not easy, and, uh, and we appreciate anything you do. I'm just hoping in the end that we're successful, that's all. I mean, you know, it's, there's, a, there's a lot of moving pieces here. And Absolutely. Of people yep. with different agendas, different attitudes, and I'm hoping that this process of bringing all this data back and talking to people that will develop a consensus as to yep. what needs to be done. Thank you, John. Anything else? I'm with him. Right. <laughs> I'm not the perfect <laughs> and a union representative. Uh, well, very good. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you taking all the time. I'll cross it out. Because we didn't actually vote to adjourn. So. Oh, okay. Well. So I, I'm actually also a former classroom teacher. Can I have teacher. your name again? Well, please. Tom Ewok, L-E-W-O-C. And I'm involved with... all the Chromebooks. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, Involved with technology integration with the district. I'm a data and software specialist. I'm also a graduate of Cheshire High School, a resident in town, and a former science teacher. Um, and yeah, parent in town of uh, Highland students. Um, I just want to call off the, build on your question about the interdepartmental sharing. Mm -hmm. um, so we have teachers not only within their departments, but also cross departments sharing. So from a technology perspective, um, I think that's one positive I wanted to bring up. We have an absolutely phenomenal setup in terms of our one-to-one -one setup with Chromebooks and the accessibility of, of the Wi-Fi network. We're compatible to many universities in the, in the state. Um, Student-wise, that's phenomenal. Teachers, however, don't have that access because even though there is a device within every learning space, teachers are sharing spaces. So. While one teacher may have a prep period, they'll be sharing additional space. They don't have access to the technology to build upon lesson plans. Um, another thing, building upon the science department, um, the handicap accessibility for wheelchairs in all the science classrooms. The students have to sit right near the front door. They don't have the ability of moving through the classrooms. Every science department has um, a large lecture bench for the teachers at the front. So student presentations and the use of students having the ability for, for power access and so forth from handicap accessibility uh, is not present. And that's actually in a wide variety of classrooms regardless of the department. Um, and the final thing is power. Um, like in this room right here, we have a wonderful space to use, but there's one power cord in the front. And we we found that out. Yeah. Yeah. So on paper, I guess is what I want to say, I want to clarify some aspects of technology. We, we've got a phenomenal, phenomenal setup for Wi-Fi. But the actual use when it comes to the peripherals in the classroom for both the teacher standpoint and for the learning spaces like this um, can't occur as we don't have the power access. Do you believe that's K-12 also? Yes. Yeah, it's in yeah. every building. 
one one perk I have is I now work at all the buildings um, across the board, Darcy through the high school. I'm also involved with the, the Quinnipiac program or in satellite offices um, and across the board. We don't have that equity for the teachers across the board and the power across the board for the students. Um, and then, then two minor things. Um, I deal a lot with the parents because we set up the, um, the lobby guard system in the front building and there's often a lot of confusion because of the dual entrances for guest speakers and parents for parking but also the security access to get into the building, what they have available to them and, and how they enter the building. That was one key thing um, parents have brought up and many times have dealt with them because our main entrance uh, leads to a foyer which then goes to the main office but most of our parents are coming for pupil personnel services or the assistant principals which are in the auxiliary part of the building down the hall. And those are the, the key things that I just want to bring that to the conversation. Security design obviously has changed dramatically uh, over the years. You know, when I first became a principal, every door in the building was open. You just walked in; it wasn't a big deal. Absolutely. Um, you're designing buildings now totally different from the new security requirements. Definitely. And we noticed it too. Myself and the other gentleman, Scott Conway, who also does the data and software management, we visit a lot of schools dealing with with PowerSchool and Google training. And uh, the security in comparison to many other schools, modern or not, we're very far behind. Yeah. Even just getting to the building. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. But I, I do have some. Do I have a motion to adjourn? I will now make the motion again. All to those adjourn. In favor. <laughs>